You can't easily find Ritalin, but you can find this. The drug we're about to talk about today improves weight loss or is more effective for weight loss in the obese than any FDA-approved drugs, including semaglutide. In this video, Leo is going to review how the most powerful appetite suppressant that you never heard of actually works. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and comment below what your thoughts are. Now, we presented to you recently, tesafenacine is one of the most powerful appetite suppressants. We're putting the coaching clients on it. Everybody's having tremendous results. But how does it actually work, and how does it compare to the other stimulant-based uh, appetite suppressants that are currently available? Just an overview. There are four classes of drugs, sort of, that are available for appetite suppression that are FDA approved. One is the GLP-1 agonist that we've talked about. Those are the most recent ones, including liraglutide and semaglutide. The drug in, in question in this video, tesofensine, beats both in effectiveness for weight loss. Another group are the stimulant type of drugs. There's Wellbutrin combined with naltrexone, FDA approved for the treatment of weight loss. There's also fenteramine combined with uh, another drug, also approved for weight loss, so I don't like this uh, option as much. There's also Orlistat, which uh, prevents your body from being able basically to digest fats. Causes a very little bit amount of weight loss over the years. The drug we're about to talk about today improves weight loss or is more effective for weight loss in the obese than any FDA approved drugs, including semaglutide. Now, we talk about a lot of underground medications for suppressing appetite and tricks and hacks and chemistry, but what Leo's doing is talking about the FDA approved or the mainstream that has a lot of research behind it. What we're really trying to do in this video is get you guys to understand the mechanisms, the reasons why tesofensine inhibits appetite, the considerations that go behind its FDA approval, why is it not approved yet? It maybe later, and some considerations you might want to take while taking it. In order to exemplify this to you guys best, I thought it'd be great to compare tesofensine to a, a relative of it, which is Wellbutrin. Remember Wellbutrin, which is also called Bupropion, is approved for weight loss with naltrexone in the US. So we're going to compare Wellbutrin to tesofensine. We're going to try to find out why is tesofensine so much more powerful. Before we do, I want to point out something. So this class of medications to inhibit appetite, they're called stimulants. Stimulants were first approved by the FDA to treat obesity in 1947 with amphetamine. The FDA did approve amphetamines. The first drug approved to treat obesity, of course, as you know, is DNP, about 20 years before. But so the second drug was actually amphetamines. And there are a long history, you probably see a chart on the screen now, of stimulants that were approved to treat obesity. So first, let's talk about bupropion, Wellbutrin. What was Wellbutrin used for? Originally, it was an antidepressant. It was approved very early on in the 70s as an antidepressant. Later, in 1997, it was approved for nicotine or smoking cessation. What does that mean? Well, it helps people quit smoking. Why? I'll tell you in a second. Third, in the 2000, late 2010s or mid-2010s, it was approved for weight loss treatment with the addition of 20 of 32 milligrams of naltrexone. We'll talk about that in a second. In, in fact, right now, let's talk about the mechanism. Why was Wellbutrin? able to do all this stuff. Well, butrin is sort of like, for those listeners who have heard about SSRIs, well, butrin is sort of like an SSRI, but for other hormones in the brain, neurotransmitters. What do SSRIs do that classical antidepressants, well, they're not really classical, but what they do is you have two cells in the brain communicating a neurotransmitter, a hormone, a, com a communicating signal, like serotonin. SSRIs stop or reuptake inhibitors, stop the second cell that's receiving the signal from releasing it, making the signal stay in between the two cells and communicate further. So it sort of enhances the communication you have from a certain amount of hormone. So SSRIs do this for serotonin, which isn't great for weight loss. Generally, depending on the receptor, but generally serotonin can cause what's called a hyperphagic response. Remember, hyper is a lot. Phagy or phagy is eating. Like for example, autophagy is eating. So hypophagic is, anyway, just wanted to find this in case you come across it in the literature. So while butrin basically inhibits the reuptake instead of serotonin between cells of dopamine and norepinephrine, which is the American word for noradrenaline, the kind of adrenaline that's in your brain. Instead, and it doesn't very much affect the serotonin system. It's usually made for people with melancholic depression, meaning a depression that isn't so anxious and stuff like that. Probably not what you get anxiety naturally, don't you? Anxiety, yeah, it's not something. Yeah. It's so not, I don't need more noradrenaline. More exactly. serotonin's okay. More dopamine is or balanced dopamine levels okay. But I don't want more noradrenaline. I even take propanolol to block. Them. Yeah. So there's some people that are not like us. They have this kind of melancholic, like they don't want to get out of bed and stuff. And for those people, they found that if they give them a bit of noradrenaline, they don't get anxious, but they get excitable. So that's where Wellbutrin was used originally as an antidepressant. Why was it used for smoking cessation? Well, just by coincidence, the molecule Wellbutrin also blocks cholinergic receptors. Those are the receptors for acetylcholine, the receptors that respond to alpha GPC. And blocking those receptors, which are also agonized by nicotine, it basically stops nicotine from being able to affect the neurons that the way it would normally. So if you're on Wellbutrin and you smoke a cigarette, you won't get as much of a dopamine release consequent to nicotine 
nicotine nicotinic cholinergic receptor agonism as you would normally. Does that help people quit smoking then? It does, right? but it should potentially in the very long term lead to the neurodegeneration. Because remember, one of the drugs used to maintain this, the integrity of the brain is the donapazole, the inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase. It may seem that blocking cholinergic receptors seems to give it an added benefit, but really for people like us who are not addicted to smoking and can't get off it, blocking the cholinergic receptors may cause a disintegration of the brain in the long term in some small way. We know that cholinergic signaling is integral to maintaining the health of the brain. So this isn't really an advantage of Wellbutrin. Why does Wellbutrin inhibit appetite? Well, the dopaminergic and noradrenergic signaling, or noradrenaline, is noradrenergic. Dopaminergic means related to dopamine. Both of these two hormones that it inhibits the reuptake of affect appetite directly through something called the pro-opio-melanocortin -opio receptors, P-O-M-C. Opio is for opioid and melanocortin is the targets of the melanotan 2, for example. This system is affected by dopamine and adrenaline directly, which affects appetite. But secondly, why would we they include naltrexone? In comparison studies, surprisingly, that Wellbutrin doesn't cause weight loss, even in rodents or reduced consumption of food, even in rodents until naltrexone is added. When naltrexone is added, significant changes occur. First of all, naltrexone, what it is, it blocks opioid receptors with great selectivity for the mu opioid receptor, more, which is the target of heroin and... Uh, morphine and uh, uh, what's that new drug there in the US that's killing everybody? Uh, fentanyl. Fentanyl, that's the same, same target, okay? So now Trexon blocks that. It's usually given to people with opiate withdrawal or even with people with alcohol withdrawal because alcoholism is also affected. The opioid system is also integral to alcohol. So both of these, one of the drugs Wellbutrin is given to people with nicotine addiction, the other one with people with opioid addiction. Interestingly, when you combine them two, people lose weight. Your natural opioids in your body are called endorphins. One of them is beta endorphin. Beta endorphin naturally, through a downstream mechanism, affects the cannabinoid 1 receptor, the target of THC also. And that cannabinoid 1 receptor in turn causes increased hunger. When you block your natural opioids from working through naltrexone, which is added to bupropion at 32 milligrams, it causes released uh, agonism of the cannabinoid 1 receptor. That's known for sure. But also, it seems to further modulate the POMC system that we're talking about with dopamine and noradrenaline, causing some synergism. In the end, it causes actual weight loss. So there's a ton of people on Wellbutrin. It's a very popular antidepressant, but I don't hear of about a lot of people on naltrexone. And how common is it really for someone to be prescribed Wellbutrin and naltrexone for appetite suppressant and for weight loss? because it's definitely a part of the research, like it's researched thoroughly, but in practical application, or is that a very common so they're not, they're not they're not prescribed together. It's a new medication. I forgot the name of the medication, but the medication medication trademark combined, combined together. Uh, and also, how often do you hear of people that you know taking Orlistat from their doctor, for example, Orlistat, the one that stops you from digesting fats, or fenteramine, yeah. which has been there for a while? I don't know how common it is really, but doctors usually don't try to get patients on this stuff. Mm -hmm. The only time that they really do is with the GLP-1 agonist for diabetes which has been really pushed recently. But yeah, it's a combined medication. Now, what does it cause, the combined medication? Over a 56-week period, I've just noted this down, it causes, across studies, between a 5 to 9.3% weight loss. Uh, over a year, a year-long period, you get a maximum of 9.3% weight loss. Of all these drugs that are currently approved, Wellbutrin and Naltrexone are the third best performing, following fenteramine, and the first best performing is semaglutide. So we're going to compare the risks versus the benefits, right? Because well, Wellbutrin plus Naltrexone, so now we're taking two pretty intense medications so also by together that have maybe even combined side effects versus then we're going to compare it to tesafenosine and see if the side effects of tesafenosine are less but what than causes the, what either is... medication or the combination of them. So it's not just the number of medications, it's the specificity of the medication. So Wellbutrin is not very specific. Obviously, it's affecting the cholinergic system, so we have some unwanted effects there. Mm. By the way, naltrexone is commonly used, but for low-dose naltrexone therapy. That's the most common. So let's talk briefly about the side effects and drawbacks to using Wellbutrin. The main side effect and drawback is whenever you use a stimulant class of appetite suppressants, there's an increased heart rate and an increased blood pressure and potential for mood uh, changes. Now with Wellbutrin, it's not seen so much the mood changes, but they do see it like also there's the nausea and potential constipation. So there's a little bit of that, but the main issue is slightly increased heart rate, slightly increased blood pressure. Well, but Wellbutrin is much less of a stimulant than fentermine and caffeine and like well, a lot of the That's what we're going to talk about next. That's what we're going to talk about next. Let's talk about Tesofancy, which really I think, is this the first channel that's been talking about it? It probably is. I haven't, I haven't heard, heard about anybody else talk about it. Everything I know about it was reading. 
research. Yeah, so, so tesofensine is a drug that was trialed as early as 2001 for the treatment of symptoms of neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. It didn't seem that successful in inhibiting the symptoms of those diseases, which by the way include a paucity of neurotransmitters like dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin in the brain. So the idea is to make the brain have more of a feeling from those receptors should make people feel better. Because I don't know if you know this, but in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, many people say, what's wrong with Alzheimer's? I just forget everything. It'll be fine. I already forget everything anyway. You know this. But the difference is you don't just forget things. You become depressed because you have mm. very low dopaminergic signaling and so on. So they trialed it for that and it wasn't very successful. But what they found out to their surprise was that these patients who had these neurodegenerative diseases started losing weight against their will. And so in 2007 or so, they first began the trials of tesofensine for the sake of weight loss for obese. Now, how does tesofensine work? Tesofensine is a triple reuptake inhibitor. So remember, SSRIs inhibit the reuptake of serotonin between cells. Well, butrin inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, noradrenaline. Now, this one, tesofensine re triple reuptakes, dopamine, serotonin, and... So, so while well, butrin isn't uh, SSRI? No, not at all. It's the opposite. Okay. The, if you add an SSRI with wellbutrin, you get the triple. So tesofensine inhibits the reuptake between cells of what are called the monoamines. There are three neurotransmitters called monoamines. They're related to each other. One is dopamine, one is noradrenaline, which is made from dopamine, and there's serotonin. So these three monoamines are inhibited. So tesofensine causes the cells in the brain to hold them a bit longer. This class of antidepressants is called, tri uh, called triple um, uh, reuptake inhibitors are a new class. They're looked, as, looked on as potentially the future of antidepressant class of medications. This molecule, tesofensine or wellbutrin, whatever, they stop what's called the transporter between cells from moving the hormone back to the, or out into the extracellular space specifically. So the transporter moves the hormone from the second cell to the extracellular space. If you block the transporter of that individual, and by the way, there are more than one transporter for each monoamine, but the other ones like VMAT are not as important. And actually, tesofensine may have activity at VMAT as well. But basically, so there's a dopamine transporter called DAT, there's a noradrenaline transporter called NET, norepinephrine, and there's a serotonin transporter called CERT. All three are blocked at different, um, to different occupancies by certain molecules that inhibit their reuptake. Now, what psychiatrists have been trying to do is this. They want serotonin block, uh, the blockade of the serotonin transporter, CERT, to be as high as possible, like 70 to 80%. They want the norepinephrine reuptake inhibition to be high as well, like 50 to 60%. But they want the dopamine reuptake inhibition to be low, 30 to 40%, like Wellbutrin. Why? because dopamine is a habituating hormone. They're concerned that especially if the drug is short acting, the person may get into a, there may be a tendency to get addicted to it or to habituate to it. So they try to limit that. Now, is that useful for appetite suppression? No, it's not. It's purely a uh, abuse potential issue. So what are the mechanisms exactly that inhibiting the reuptake of these three monoamines could cause tesofensine to inhibit appetite so well? It's not the serotonin. The reason that we're, they're using the serotonin part there, really what, what scientists would do is make a Wellbutrin type drug with a much stronger re reuptake inhibition of dopamine. The problem with Wellbutrin is too little, but the concern is as they raise that DAT, the dopamine transporter reuptake inhibition, they're concerned that without serotonin, remember dopamine and serotonin sort of balance each other in the brain. Without serotonin increasing, which is does the opposite of habituation, the person may be liable to become addicted. So here, the reason that serotonin reuptake inhibition is there is mainly just to prevent abuse potential. The effect on appetite suppression has been determined to be clearly and individually due to dopamine increased signaling at the dopamine 1 receptor and increased signaling at the noradrenaline alpha 1 receptor. Those are the exact two receptors that tesofensine causes weight loss through and so does Wellbutrin also, but it, Wellbutrin doesn't do it on its own. So that's how it's working exactly. How many noradrenaline receptors are there? Is there a many? Oh, types? Yeah, yeah, there are many types. Absolutely. There's alpha, I mean, I beta, know there's, I know there's, there's three betas, there's uh, four alphas, I think. Oh, okay, it's like seven types or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, same I didn't know same with the one. dopamine one. It's not one receptor, it's dopamine one like receptors. There's two actually. Mm -hmm. So well, that's the mechanism. It's the it's a dopamine one and alpha uh, one adrenaline receptor, which is interesting. So for example, say you use clenbuterol, thinking it'll uh, inhibit your appetite. Clenbuterol won't affect your dopamine system, mm -hmm. so it'll just hit that al the adrenaline receptor. So this is really quite a bit superior. Now let's give a comparison in terms of dopamine uh, transporter occupancy. 
How much does these, do these drugs stop your two cells from getting rid of dopamine to the uh, extracellular space? Well, butrin, 30 to 40% occupancy. Methylphenidate Ritalin is about 50 to 70%. Tesofensine is about 65%. So Tesofensine, I, I think 65, yeah, 60, exactly 65%. So Tesofensine is almost as powerful in inhibiting the reuptake of dopamine as Ritalin is. Mm. You can't easily find Ritalin, but you can find Tesofensine. I use mine from Swiss Chems, by the way, which is the interesting thing about Swiss Chems I've discovered is that they check each batch for the actual quantity in the batch. They test each single batch, so I feel a bit more safe getting it from there. But the point is, so Tesofensine occupies the dopamine transporter about double as much as Wellbutrin and almost as much as methylphenidate does, which is why it's so powerful. Next, let's talk about the effect. How strong is tesofensine and how much does it cause weight loss in controlled placebo control study? So in 2008, there's a phase two trial. It shows, depending on the milligram doses, you, they usually use 0.5 milligram and one milligram of tesofensine. Some studies will trial a quarter of a milligram. I'm gonna use the one milligram dose just to compare. So one, so you guys remember, one milligram dose over a six month period causes over 10% weight loss. So this is very important because for example, semaglutide causes about, if I remember correctly, at the 2.5, 4 milligram once weekly dose, causes about 14% weight loss in a year or over a year. So we're talking about significantly more weight loss than semaglutide. In fact, I have to look at the numbers, but the only GLP-1 agonist that I know of that's more powerful than tesofensine is called terzapidine. It's a GLP-1 agonist combined with a GIP-1 agonist, which is a new class of medications. Also, nobody has talked about on YouTube before, but they're not out quite yet. But it's called terzapatide. Terzapatide causes a, a higher weight loss at the 15 milligram dose over a 40 week period. But I was right. Yeah, so it's 14, 14% is what semaglutide can do over a 68 week period. Whereas tesofensine in a six month period causes a weight loss of over 10%. So tesofensine, which is shocking because the first time I ever took semaglutide, I found I couldn't eat at all. Now, the interesting thing is, is, that, is there a synergy between these GLP-1 agonists, which don't work. I mean, they're, they're not centrally stimulating. That's the difference. They call them centrally stimulating appetite suppressants or not. There might be a lot of synergy between the two, but we'll talk more about synergies in a future video. So tesofensine side effects are similar to all the centrally acting stimulants that affect appetite suppression. It's mainly the normal ones, nausea, vomiting, stuff like that from being from not being hungry. But also, as I mentioned before, the unique thing about the stimulants is they increase heart rate and increase blood pressure. In fact, there are studies combining tesofensine with metropolol, which is similar to propranolol, but a bit more selective of a beta blocker. They call it the tesomet. They combine them together and find that while angiotensin receptor uh, inhibitors like ARBs, while they're effective at limiting the side effect a bit from tesofensine and similar drugs, the best uh, drug to use is a selective beta blocker. The best one, although they didn't try it, would be nebivolol. That's what Tony and I have been using in combination with tesofensine. It doesn't reduce the effects on hunger, but almost completely can inhibit the increased heart rate and blood pressure, which is key if you're going to use this long term. So those are the main side effects. All right, friends, sorry for such a long video, but I wanted you guys to get like a comprehensive, you know, introduction to how tesofensine works before we continue with more videos on it. There's some key takeaways that Tony and I prepared for you guys. I want to go through them one by one. One is to, to remember that the reason why the balance between dopamine and serotonin is needed is because of dopamine being such a habituating hormone and serotonin being able to balance this. Well, butrin is a poor choice for weight loss, bupropion, because it's not very effective. It has a, I think, less than half an effect size as tesofensine, but also it doesn't provide the protective effect of inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, which causes neurogenesis, as everyone knows. As we said, tesofensine is more cap more effective than any other FDA-approved weight loss medication on the market and should be more effective than clenbuterol, for example, and other molecules. What's wonderful about it is not only does it have a higher dopaminergic activity, but it has that protective serotonergic activity, uh, which limits abuse potential and increases neurogenesis in the brain and protects your brain, but also it has a very long half-life. It makes you more stable, so there's less likelihood of this kind of addictive kind of behavior. Now, what we're gonna talk about next in future videos is synergisms with tesofensine and other drugs. We'll begin with naltrexone, probably tomorrow, but either tomorrow or the day after. We'll begin with naltrexone. We'll give you guys an idea of our thoughts and experimentation if we get there uh, quickly with naltrexone and tesofensine. We look forward to seeing you guys later on today for a second video.